Chapter 15, verse 1 Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honour thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honoureth not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Here we find a major problem between the Lord and the so-called law keepers. Pre the Lord's arrival on earth, the Jews had obviously been in and out of captivity, and during their time in Babylon, they had retained a lot of man-made traditions. And due to the fact that they were putting tradition above scripture or they were using their tradition to interpret scripture when it should have been the other way around they were in reality nullifying scripture this is a problem that bible believers have long had with roman catholics catholics are very much bound by tradition and scripture being on par and sometimes tradition quote unquote supersedes scripture that is a big mistake the scripture must always be used to interpret tradition, church councils, encyclicals, so on and so forth. The scripture also must be used to interpret what the early church fathers said, never the other way around. So here the Lord is dealing precisely and directly with the problem of tradition elevating scripture. And like I say, it was a big problem in the first century and it's still a big problem in the 21st century. As I say, Bible believers like myself do a lot of apologetical work with Catholics and Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and other groups trying to get them to see that scripture is supreme, not tradition. 7. Ye hypocrites, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. We were told to not only be a hearer of the word, but also a doer of the word. These people had a religious knowledge of the Lord. They are very much found in the second chapter, when the wise men come to Herod, and the scribes advise Herod quite rightly that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem, and yet, when the wise men turn around and head off to Bethlehem, the scribes remain with Herod. They had a head knowledge, but their hearts were still desperately wicked and in need of the new birth. And here, it's the same language. These people are giving the Lord lip service. They are religiously active. They want to be seen as righteous and respectable among their communities and their peers, but their hearts are far from God. 9. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Very much like you find in the Church of Rome, where you find a lot of vain worship, vain repetition. Uh, the Hail Mary, for example, would be recited numerous times during a typical rosary. Even the Lord's Prayer would be cited two or three times uh, during a typical trip to the confession booth and the priest will say to the penitent Catholic uh, you now need to say three Our Fathers and two Hail Marys and they go away thinking that by reciting that vain repetition they will be heard by God and forgiven and of course that's not what the Lord wants you to do he wants you to believe totally on his son in order to be saved and then you walk in the spirit and if you stumble and if you sin you confess your sins to God not to a man in a box but to God 10 and he called the multitude and said unto them hear 
and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples, and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended, after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter, and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Ye, plural. Although Peter is the main spokesman here, the Lord is mildly rebuking the apostles because they also needed to be expounded upon, they needed to be taught, they needed to have the Lord explain to them what he had just said, when in reality they should have known what he was saying. 17. Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly, and is cast out into the drought? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Post the cross, all of the dietary laws were lifted, and those that wanted to could pretty much eat what they wanted to, providing it didn't cause a weak brother or sister to stumble. And here the Lord is saying that it's not what goes into you that defiles you, but what comes out. Thefts, adulteries, fornications. This isn't a comprehensive list. There's no paedophilia mentioned there, but that would also clearly be condemned. There's no homosexuality there, but that too would clearly be condemned. There's no lesbianism there, but that too will clearly be condemned when you read other scriptures. But here he's dealing with the main problem that from a wicked heart proceeds evil thoughts, and that would feed into murders, adulteries, fornications, so on and so forth. 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts, and cried unto him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. This scripture fascinates me. Here you find a woman pleading with the Lord, the son of David, to come and heal her daughter, which is being tormented by a devil. We don't know how old this girl was and why she was possessed. We also don't know. Today, in the 21st century, we have a huge problem of occult activity, a fascination with the supernatural, the paranormal, and the main people that are buying into this and practicing this are young girls. Ouija boards, tarot cards, clairvoyance, mediums, so on and so forth. Young girls are very much attracted to the occult. Hence why so many of these young girls are cutting themselves, harming themselves, and also committing suicide. I believe it was last year and the year before that we had over a dozen suicides in a town in Wales called Bridge End, I believe it was. And the police didn't really understand what the link was, but uh, it's my understanding that for the most part some of these boys and girls were involved with spiritualism and once you get involved with spiritualism, if you're not born again, if you haven't been saved from it, it leaves a permanent scar on you. And I've heard some powerful and quite distressing testimonies of people that have come out of the occult. And although they are saved, some of them still retain the scars from their years in the occult. Much is true of those that have come out of the sex industry, quote unquote, they are now saved, they are now born again, but they still struggle from time to time with the scars, with the flashbacks. And also the same is true of being involved with the cults. 
And again, I know people that have come out of cults and they are still struggling 10, 15, 20 years after leaving those groups behind. And some of these people are saved and on a lot of medication. But here, this mother is coming to the Lord, pleading with him to heal her daughter. And it's just possible that this woman, her daughter perhaps as well, has been involved with spiritism of some kind. Hence why she needs her daughter to be set free from it. 23. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. She was causing a scene. And the apostles didn't like that. But uh, read on, because her persistence pays off. 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So many times have I said this, and I'll say it again, that he came first and foremost to Israel, to the chosen people. This woman was a half Jew and half Gentile. He's still going to deal with her. He's dealt with the centurion from John 5, and he's dealt with other Gentiles along the way. But his main remit was to come to his own people. And then he would send his apostles, and they would go to the ends of the earth. 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. A very negative term to describe a non-Jew, a Gentile to some extent, and Gentiles were and are still seen by the Jewish community to this day as unclean. The same is true of Muslims. Muslims consider dogs, lich or pets to be unclean and if a dog runs towards a Muslim they will move out of the way. They consider animals, especially dogs, to be unclean. But here the Lord as the Jewish Messiah going to the people of Israel is following the Mosaic Covenant. He's following the ceremonial and civil aspect of the law and he is keeping a distance as it were between him and the non-Jews 27 and she said truth Lord that's humility to be called a dog and say truth Lord is humility yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table that's the sort of humility that you need if you aren't born again if you are the sort of person that admires the philosophy of Christ, as somebody told me last week, but has yet to receive Christ, they need to come back to the Bible. You need to read this scripture and see this non-Jewish lady humbling herself, desperately wanting her daughter to be set free from an unclean spirit, which she may personally have introduced to her daughter. She may possibly have been responsible for her daughter's possessiveness of this devil that's just my own view but either way her daughter is possessed by an unclean spirit and her mother is seeking the Lord to set her free from this devil 28 then Jesus answered and said unto her O woman great is thy faith be it unto thee even as thou wilt and her daughter was made whole from that very hour prayer works persistent prayer always works there's an account in the gospel of luke when the lord talks about two people that were praying in the temple and there was a self-righteous character and there was a humble character and the humble character said lord be merciful to me a sinner and i believe that person prayed that prayer many times but on that one occasion that he prayed it the Lord heard him and he was saved it says he went home justified this woman's persistence this woman's intercession for her daughter possessed by an unclean spirit has paid off and she was healed from that very hour straight away the Lord didn't touch her he just delivered her that's a power directly from heaven nobody anywhere on planet earth could do that.
and I challenge anybody who believes that healing and exorcisms are still uh, possible for today anybody who believes in the deliverance ministry I challenge any of those people to show me anybody anywhere in the world that could heal somebody possessed with a spirit just by saying you are forgiven just by doing it we are told Pope Pius XII tried to exercise Adolf Hitler but it never happened Hitler was possessed I believe all the days of his life and yet the Pope of Rome when he wears his triple tiara is Lord of Heaven and Hell and also Purgatory that's what they believe that kind of got modified at Vatican II the Second Vatican Council but Pius believed that he had the authority to deliver Hitler from his spirit which was gripping him which was controlling him and he couldn't set Hitler free from the spirit Hitler wasn't aware by the way that Pius was trying to deliver him and in 1945 Hitler kills himself and soon afterwards Pope Pius XII in Rome gives Adolf Hitler a requiem mass Hitler was a Catholic he lived as a Catholic he flirted with spiritualism and the occult and other areas of that area but nonetheless he lived died and was given a Catholic burial he never renounced the Church of Rome he strayed he got into all sorts of problems as I say but in his mind he was a Catholic unto death hence why the Church of Rome gave him a requiem mass that's your problem again with tradition over the scripture but here this woman's persistence has paid off 29 and Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there and great multitudes came unto him having with them those that were lame blind dumb maimed and many others and cast them down at Jesus' feet and he healed them insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak the maimed to be whole the lame to walk and the blind to see and they glorified the God of Israel that's the whole point of miracles to give God the glory not all miracles would lead people to repentance and faith in fact in John chapter 11 when Lazarus was raised from the dead soon afterwards the Jews held a council to kill Christ but the miracles here were given for the glory of God they were given to strengthen the apostles also and they were also given to strengthen the faith of those that were already saved and for those that were going to be saved but not all miracles resulted in people's salvation 32 then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat and I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way that's the great shepherd coming for his sheep and shepherding them looking after them 33 and his disciples say unto him whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude second time the disciples fail to grasp that the Lord is going to perform yet another miracle and this shows the honesty of Matthew's authorship he is content to present this to his community in 39 AD and he was content for them to read this and think how could you still not have grasped the enormity of the Lord's Messiahship his omniscience his omnipresence his omnipotence how could you fail to grasp that because they are flesh the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak Lord increase our faith increase our faith amen to that 34 and Jesus saith unto them how many loaves have ye and they said seven and a few fishes and he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground and he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks 
and break them, and gave to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat, and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets full. And they that did eat were four thousand men, beside women and children. And he sent away the multitude, and took ship, and came into the coasts of Magdala. Time after time he doesn't want people to crown him king. He doesn't want people to come and give him this mass worship that would come later. That comes every day, post the new birth. But here, once again, he is providing for their needs. And there was food left over, like we saw in the previous account, the previous mass miracle. Christ was the miracle maker. He did miracles like nobody ever did. And yet, just a few chapters later, these same people, this same generation, are going to say, crucify him. Crucify him. Let his blood be on our children. How quickly things change. But the Gospel of John, second chapter, said that he knew what was in man and didn't need any man to testify of him. He knows everything. As I say, he is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. The three characters of deity.